Hello folks, this is Todd Coburn with Lecture 5 of Arrow 3271 at Cal Poly Pomona. Today we're going to be continuing our study into fatigue stresses and we're going to focus specifically on how we characterize fluctuating stresses. Now we've already been looking at fully reverse bending stresses and there are parts that are like that, mostly shafts under bending. Other parts experience completely different kinds of loadings, which may vary from one kind to another. So our first step in being able to evaluate those is be able to characterize a stress that doesn't fall into that fully reverse bending stress uh, category, and then to go and learn to put different types of stresses together. Today we're going to focus on characterizing our stresses. There are two major stresses, learning what parameters we're going to use to characterize them, and then choosing a failure mode and evaluating them within that failure mode. Here's how it works. So we already saw in our prior lecture that we can characterize our fatigue strength by identifying a SN curve. By coming up with the SN curve of the material, we can predict the SN curve of the material with nothing more than the FTU of the material. We can use FTU to find out what number of uh, what the strength is for one cycle, what the strength is for a thousand fully reverse cycles, and what the strength is for a million fully reverse cycles and beyond. Okay. Now, what this was for though is a fully reverse stress. We saw that that was that round sample loaded in pure bending being rotated so we have a nice uniform change for any point from tension to compression and so on. New, uh, graphically, that looks like what's shown here. If we plot the number of cycles against the stress level, we're going to be going from no stress to a maximum tension stress to a maximum compression stress and back and forth at any one point if we follow one point around the sample. The fatigue stress ratio, since our uh, minimum stress is exactly the same as but the negative of the maximum stress, our stress ratio is uh, one point is minus one. So we're characterized by a single stress scenario. We have repeated it over and over, forever and ever, hallelujah. And we're transi transitioning for tens from tension to compression and back again for each and every point. This is what Bilbo Baggins was talking about when he wrote his book, From There and Back Again. He was not talking about orcs and ogres, he's talking about fatigue, but he got it wrong. Now, unfortunately, many stresses don't fall into this category of moving from negative to positive to negative to positive and over and over. They have other characteristics. Let's take a look at what those might be. For example, we might have what we call a repeated load, where we're going from uh, we're going from zero to some value and back to zero. Remember, a fully reverse stress is going to the negative of that stress to the positive of that stress. A repeated stress goes from zero to something and back to zero, so it never goes negative. It's just repeating over and over. That's a repeated load. Okay. A general stress would be one that's not fully reversed and it's not repeating, it's something else, which means it's going from some maximum value to some minimum value. Now obviously, all of these are talking about a nice sinusoidal change from one stress level to the other, and that only happens for some parts. Many parts can have all kinds of reckless changes from one kind of stress to the other. But for the most part, what we're going to do in fatigue analysis is just look at what is the maximum stress and what is the minimum stress. And we're going to use those two values to characterize our stresses into two other values as we see on the next slide. So here we're going to start characterizing what we're going to do looking at that stress curve. Let's take a look at it. We're going from some stress level to another stress level, a max to a min. So the first thing we're going to need to do is identify what is the maximum stress on the part and what is the minimum stress on the part. Now that we have those two values, we're going to turn those into two other values, the mean and the alternating stress. Okay, so you'll see the mean stress is just the average of those stress and the 
alternating stress is just the difference in those stress over two or half the difference. You'll notice these two equations are identical except that one has a positive sign and one has a negative sign. You'll also notice that I have this little case of f over the right and you'll notice the case of f wasn't there initially. Let me do that again. I'm going to back up. You ready for this? Whoops, backing up. I showed you this mean stress. That's the equation for the mean stress. And we may or may not apply a stress concentration factor to it. Okay. Now for our purposes, if there's a stress concentration factor, we're going to apply it to both the mean and the alternating stress. However, there are uh, many specific types of loading and parts and materials where we will only apply it to one or the other or neither. So what we're going to do is first call, calculate the mean stress and then determine what the stress concentration factor is, K sub T turn it into a fatigue stress concentration factor by applying the Nuber factor, right, the stress, uh, the, the stress notch sensitivity factor to it through the Nuber equation. And that gives us the fatigue stress concentration factor. And then we smack that up against the mean stress. Now what we could do to draw attention to this, we could call this Fm prime, which means it's the non-factored mean stress. And then once we've determined whether or not there's an, a, a stress concentration factor, we either apply it, uh, we apply whatever it is to the stress. Now the stress, not, the stress concentration factor might be one. If the, there's no notches, then that factor is one. And if the notch has no effect, then it will be one. But we could call FMM prime the value before we apply the notch sense the stress concentration factor, and F sub M the value after we've applied that. So it reminds us to calculate what is the stress concentration factor if it applies. Once again, we're not applying the theoretical stress concentration factor K sub T. We're calculating the fatigue stress concentration factor where we've taken K sub T and modified it with the notch sensitivity to calculate what the fatigue stress concentration factor is. Then we calculate our alternating component and we will do the same thing, call that F sub A prime and then multiply it by any fatigue stress concentration factor that applies. Now if you read the problem statement and there's no indication, no evidence of any kind of feature that would cause stress concentration, don't be alarmed, don't panic, just apply K sub F as 1.0, which means there's no additional stress concentration factor due to some geometric feature. Got that? Okay, now that you understand that, we can also define the range stress, which is just the max minus the min. That means it's twice the alternating. Now, we're not going to use that for fatigue, but it sometimes is used to characterize fatigue. We're not going to use this now, we're not going to use it for bolts, but we are going to use that later when we get to welds. We will be using the range stress rather than the alternating stress. Okay, so I'm introducing it here. And then the idea of the stress ratio. Now remember, we already defined stress ratios as the applied stress divided by the uh, allowable stress when we're talking about interaction equations. This is a completely different stress ratio with the same name. I'm sure you have no friends that have the same name as each other, right? Not no two Georges or Henrys or Toms or whatevers. But in this case, we got two things with the exact same name. Stress ratio, we're talking about interaction equations, is the applied stress divided by the allowable. Stress ratios, when we're talking about fatigue, is the minimum and the maximum stress. Got that? Okay. We're actually not going to use this for hardly anything, except sometimes we'll see that it helps classify fatigue stresses as we saw in some earlier charts uh, figures last lecture. Okay. With that all defined, we now have changed our max and min stress into these two characterization stresses, FM and FA. Okay. Oh, one other term we may use is this amplitude ratio. We're not going to use that at all, but you should be aware of it because it can also be used. Okay. Once we've turned our max and min stress into the mean and alternating component, we then are going to evaluate uh, the stress, whether or not we have a positive margin of safety for infinite life. And then we may even go further. In order to do that, we're going to have to choose a failure mode. 
And this is going to be similar to what we did with interaction equations back in 3261. So you may want to review your Aero 3261 handbook before moving onward. Okay, so uh, before we go on, one thing, one word. We talked about, I said this on the last slide, but we generally, in this class, we're going to apply for general fatigue. We're going to apply our stress concentration factor to both the mean and the alternating component. I already said this. However, you need to be aware that some places, some people, some parts will use a different approach. And particularly one of those cases would be if we expect plastic strain. Remember, we started this semester with plastic bending. And if you have plastic bending, you know how that peak stress concentration factor kind of evens out when you're going up into the elastic, into fully plastic range. And in that case, a lot of times they won't apply it to the mean stress. They'll only apply it to the alternating stress. We'll do something similar for uh, fatigue of bolts later. Okay. Okay, so now if we have, now that we have characterized our stresses as speed and alternating, we need to be able to evaluate the proximity to failure. And when we do that, the first failure we're going to check is the fatigue strength of this part versus infinite life. And to do that, we need to choose a failure mode. So uh, various people have proposed various failure modes, and you can see from this curve here that it's kind of similar to an interaction curve in the way it ha happened, is handled. You'll notice on the horizontal axis we have the mean stress, and on the vertical axis we have an alternating stress. Therefore, let's say we have no alternating stress. That means our stress is not changing, it's just constant, which basically means we have a static load. If that were the case, how high should we go? You would probably think it should be able to go to FTU, right? But if you wanted to be real conservative, you might say, no, no, I'm only going to let it go to the yield stress. Okay. The yield stress, which is shown FTY and also sometimes shown as S sub Y, capital S sub Y, right? Now let's say, okay, instead of a that, let's say we have a fully reverse stress, which means there's the mean stress is zero. We're going for the same maximum and minimum stress. How high can we go then? Now, if we wanted to be really simple with no other information, you might say, well, we don't want any plastic, plastic deformation because that will cause the part to change. So we ought to be able to go to FTY, negative FTY, and so on, right? That's it. So what the Langer criteria does is say, okay, let's set our two failure points on the mean stress axis. We'll put our FTY. And on the alternating axis, we put our FTY. You'll notice these are both shown with triangles. We'll draw a straight line between them. Any point plotted on this curve, inside the curve, we will assume is fine. And any point plotted outside the curve, we will assume is not fine. So if we have a point right here, where we have, let's say we have 20 KSI mean stress and 20 KSI alternating stress, just like with interaction equations, we could draw a line through that, take the length of this curve, Divided by the length of this part of the curve, minus 1, gives us our margin of safety against infinite life. It's a positive margin. If, for example, instead we have 40 KSI mean stress and 30 KSI alternating stress, we're out here. It's beyond this allowable curve, so it's a negative margin. We draw our line through it. We take the allowable length divided by this length, minus 1, and we would find we have a negative margin. That's how it works for the Langer criteria. Got it? Now there are some obvious flaws with this. And so we that brings us to the Gerber criteria. The Gerber criteria says, wait a minute, what are you stopping? If you have a single force, a static load, you ought to be able to go to FTU. We want our structure to be light. We can know we're good for that much. We know the structure will not fail if you go to FTU. Therefore, the Goodman criteria says on the mean stress level, we're going to go to FTU, as shown here as 80 KSI for this particular example. Now, on the alternating curve, if we have a fully reverse stress, the Goodman criteria says, what the heck, using the yield criteria, or the yield allowable, we know we can't be good for infinite life for anything more than S sub E. So it plots S sub E on the 
vertical axis. It then draws a straight line through, and points are characterized in exactly the same manner by just coming and plotting the point. Let's say we have 30 KSI and 15 KSI. You draw a line through the point. You take the two relative distances, this one over this one, minus one, to get the margin of safety. That looks like a positive margin right there. Got it? This is much better than the Langer criteria, but also a gross simplification. We see this point here of 40 KSI, 20 KSI would be a negative margin. Now another criterion, the modified Goodman comes along and says, wait a minute, okay, so we buy what you say about not being able to go above the S sub B on the alternating because of what we've our testing shows. However, we're not comfortable having any plastic strain in the part if we're going to be repeating loads because that will probably change our answer. And so what this criteria does is follow the Goodman criteria through the first part of the curve from S sub E and then it cuts off with the Langer criteria aiming for FTY. So it's going from S sub E to FTY. And that is a nice, simple, conservative approach. And there, if we cut, that brings us to our next idea. The Gerber criteria comes along, and then when it looks at the, the testing of samples plotted against the other criterion, and it says those are actually sec predicting negative margin for many parts that we can test and show that they're still good. So Gerber comes along and puts a semi-elliptical curve fit through the data with a simple equation, and his equation gives this curve here. And what that says is, he says we ought to be good for FTU on the mean stress, we ought to be good for S sub E, just like the Goodman criteria, but he takes this semi-elliptical curve between them and that tends to match the data fairly well. This is probably my favorite criterion because it's still relatively simple and it uses FTU on the one axis which is a good approach that's consistent approach for for uh, aircraft parts and it uses F sub E on the vertical axis. Now the ASME elliptic failure criterion comes along. It takes a similar approach, but it uses the more conservative value of take going from S sub E on the vertical axis to FTY on the horizontal axis. And it also uses a semi-elliptical curve. Anything inside the curve is good. Anything outside the curve is good. Now, if we look at all of these together, uh, we plot them together. It's kind of insightful. We can see, we can see Langer coming in here as a dashed line from up out of nowhere down to 60 KSI. We see the Goodman from 30 KSI to 80 KSI. We see the Gerber, which is that solid semi-elliptical arc. And then we see the ASME elliptic, which is our uh, is that a hidden line? I guess that's a hidden line going to the or a phantom line, a center line, excuse me, to from the endurance limit to FTY. So a couple questions. Which criteria is the most conservative? Looks like the modified Goodman, right? That's the smallest of all of them. Which is the looks the easiest to implement? Well, probably the Langer or the Goodman, right? That's the easiest. Which criteria looks the least conservative? Looks like the Gerber is least conservative. Which criterion looks the best? Well, that kind of depends, doesn't it? We'd have to look at some test data. Here is another curve that's kind of bringing uh, to our attention the way that we're plotting our margins of safety. We already talked about that briefly as we went through the other curves. So we'll go ahead and jump to the next curve. Oh, one, uh, We'll just jump to the next curve at this point. So once again, this what this is bringing the attention to the fact is, remember, the way we're doing uh, margins of safety is just like we do with interaction equations, where we're plotting the point, we're drawing a line from the origin through the point, and then we're evaluating the proximity to the curve. Now, normally what we do is this, this method C. That's the way 
we normally do this drawing a line from the origin through the point and on through the failure criterion and then measuring the relative lengths. If you read your Arrow 3261 handbook where it talks about stress ratios, you'll find we also, if we expect one only one stress can change while the other one can't, or stress uh, either the mean stress can change or the alternating stress can change but not the other, then that gives us the A and the B type. And the C type shown here, or the D type, the last one shown here, is basically going and coming up with a margin of safety on the closest proximity to that failure criterion. We're not going to use that at all. Okay. So this is showing your uh, failure. These are the equations of those curves. Now we're not going to use these at all because I'm going to actually compute, uh, take these a step further and come up with values that we need. Okay. Here's how it's going to work. So when we're evaluating fluctuating stresses, the first thing we're going to do is characterize our stresses to get the mean and the alternating curve. And that assumes we've already included the stress concentration factor in those, like we talked about. Next, we're going to choose a failure criterion. Now, you're in a class and you're students, so basically you're going to look at the problem for which criterion to use. If the problem doesn't tell you which one to use, we're going to use Gerber. Otherwise, use what it says. Got that? Okay. So we can use the modified Goodman, the Gerber, or the ASCME elliptic. If we have the modified Goodman, we're going to go over here and take this first equation to evaluate the margin of safety. We're just evaluating the alternating component of stress. Remember that any stress concentration factor is already buried in there. Compared to the old air endurance limit and the mean stress compared to the FTU to calculate a margin of safety. If we're using the Gerber criterion, you'll plug into the second equation, which uses FTU, the mean stress, the alternating stress, the endurance limit, the mean stress, the endurance limit, the FTU, and the alternating component. Got that? If we use the ASME elliptic, we're going to be plugging in the alternating component against the endurance limit, the mean component during against the yield stress. Okay, that's FTY now. So first step is we're going to go and choose our failure criterion. We're going to evaluate the margin of safety against infinite life. If this margin of safety is positive, that means the part will last forever. It's expected to last forever and ever. If you kept cycling it, it would still be cycling when your children are born and your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. Now, I don't believe that, but that's what this criterion says and that's what we're going to use. Okay. Now, one other caveat, the Langer criteria, sometimes it will ask you, I will ask you to evaluate the margin of safety against yielding. Well, yielding actually occurs at the proportional limit. For, for our purposes, we will just assume that yielding occurs at FTY. So all you really have to do is write the margin of safety against of the max stress against the FTY. Okay? The idea behind that is that if you exceed, if your max stress exceeds FTY, you're going to get yielding of the part. And if you repeat the loading on the part, that yielding may cause failure that was not accounted for in the fatigue testing. Okay. Now, if you look at this equation for Langer's yield criteria, this is called Langer's yield criteria. But all it's doing is checking the max stress against yielding. Which, and the, remember the max stress is just the same as the mean plus the alternating is what the max stress is. So this is showing you in that form. Okay. So we're not going to use Langer's as one of our fatigue criteria, but we'll sometimes go and evaluate the margin of safety against yielding. And if that shows a negative margin of safety, that means the first time we experience that ex maximum stress, we can expect yielding of the part. And that doesn't mean the part is going to fail, but it means that the part may not be as strong as the rest of the fatigue analysis predicts. Does that make sense? So if our margin of safety is positive with these three criteria, modified Goodman, Gerber, and Lea semi-elliptic, we expect the part to last forever. If that margin of safety is negative, that means the part will not last forever. It doesn't necessarily mean the part will fail before we are done with it. Because in engineering, we also have a predicted life, how many, a predicted number of cycles that we need to be good for. In aerospace, we'll often predict the ground-air-ground -ground cycles. Each 
ground. From the plane is on the ground to get to the air, there's load conditions on the ground, there's load conditions for takeoff, there's load conditions in flight, and there's load conditions for landing and taxing. If you take all these load conditions, all of the different ones happen at different times, and the cumulative effect of all those determines whether what environment the part was exposed to for that ground air ground flight. Aircraft are designed for a certain number of ground air ground flights, after which they're not allowed to be used unless they are inspected and repaired as necessary and certified for an additional number of flights. Therefore, we can have many parts on the plane that don't last forever, but that are plenty strong enough to live through the designed life of the plane. So, if we get a negative margin for infinite life here, that just means we're going to have to do more work. We're going to do more work to determine whether or not the part is good. Now, if the part has to be good for infinite life, and some parts are, then this would mean constitute failure if we get a negative margin. But if this cause says we have a negative margin against infinite life, it's still possible that that part is totally fine. And all we have to do is figure out, well, how many cycles do we need to be good for? How many cycles are we good for? Now, now that we know that we've got negative margin for infinite life, we now have to characterize our stresses so that we can predict how many cycles we need to be good for. To do that, if you think back, you'll remember that we actually have the whole SN curve, which talks not just about infinite life, but it talks about what happens for low cycle and high cycle fatigue. But remember that curve, all of the data of that curve fitting that we did was based on a fully reverse stress level. So if we want to take our fluctuating stress, which is different than the fully reverse stress, and actually use that SN curve, which is based on a fully reverse stress cycle, what we have to do is convert our fluctuating stress into an equivalent fully reverse stress. The way we will do that is by using the exact same failure criterion and tweaking it. Remember I showed you the equations of the curves for each of these criteria a moment ago and I said, don't worry, we're not going to use those. Well, we are going to use them, but we're going to use a modified form because I've solved those for you so we can calculate what's the equivalent fully reverse stress. It looks like this. If we're using the modified Goodman, then plug your alternating and mean component in, and FTU into the this equation and you will predict the equivalent fully reverse stress of your mean and alternating stress. If we're using Gerber, we're going to plug in the alternating mean and FTU into the second equation. If we have the ASME elliptic, we'll plug those values that have alternating mean and FTY into the third equation. Now that we have the equivalent fully reverse stress, we now can go and use those Paris equations that we saw before to characterize fatigue, which means we can use this, either calculate the stress that we're good for, for the number of cycles we need, or calculate the number of cycles that we will get for that stress level. That means we've already ass assessed, is this going to be fall in the low cycle or the high cycle fatigue range, and use the corresponding A and B. The A and B shown here are for high cycle fatigue, and you know what to do. If it's not high cycle fatigue, right, you're going to use either the low cycle fatigue or the high cycle fatigue numbers based on our stress level. Okay. And all this is in your handbook. That's what that means. Okay. Now, if we have more than one type of loading uh, causing these stresses, there's another way we can deal with this, and this is going to be calculating the von Mises stress. Back in Arrow 3261, we learned that the von Mises stress sprung out of our distortional energy theory. And we got this equation for plane stress, which means we just plug in our stress in the x direction, our stress in the y direction, and our shear stress. This would be like if we have a little element with stress on all the faces, shear stresses, normal stresses. We plug into this equation, we can calculate the von Mises stress. Okay. Once again, we have to keep uh, our eye on the fatigue stress concentration factor, and we can use a modification of those shown here. So actually we can take our mean and alternating component. If we have axial load bending and torsion, we can modify these equations above to come into these 
equations below. This is our mean and alternating component of the von Mises stress using those equations above. This would be for plane stress. So if we have our little element, we calculate the torsion on the stress, the torsional stress, along with, now, one caveat. Here in this equation, you'll see we've got K sub F and the stress level. Remember, we're not going to apply that twice. So if you already applied K sub F to the mean and alternating component of a stress in an earlier step, you're not going to apply it again here, right? This is just reminding us that we need to apply those stress concentration factors. So we can actually use these equations to characterize our stresses if we have different types of stresses causing those fluctuating stresses. Got that? Okay. So here's our, a summary of our basic approach. We're going to determine our allowables of the material, right? FTU and FTY from our appendix. We then are going to use FTU to calculate S sub B prime, making sure that we don't forget that there is a cutoff for some of the values. We're going to calculate our max and min stress that are applied and we're also going to evaluate our fatigue stress concentration factor by calculating our K sub T and then applying the newer equation and then to get the notch sensitivity and turn that into a fatigue stress concentration factor. We then characterize, determine our characteristic stresses, our FM and our FA. If we have different types of stresses, we can use the von Mises stress to combine them. We're we'll only do this for a few examples, not for everything. We then will choose the suitable failure criterion. You're going to look to the problem statement, determine which one. If it doesn't say anything about it, we use Gerber. And then we'll calculate the margin of safety for infinite life. If that's positive, we're done. We know the part will survive. If that's negative, we're not done. And now we're going to have to calculate the Fourier reverse stress by using the, same, the similar equation for that failure criterion. Then we'll take that Fourier reverse stress and we will use that uh, to predict the number of cycles that we're good for and compare that to the number of cycles that we need to calculate our margin of safety. Got that? Let's look at a couple conceptual qu questions. Let's say we have a part loaded repeatedly as shown. Is this as high or as low cycle fatigue? Who knows? We'd have to go and evaluate the maximum stress against the F FTU to figure out which one it is, right? Which failure criterion should we use? Well, that depends on the problem statement, but if it doesn't say anything, we're going to use Gerber. Why Gerber? And this is why. Well, basically because I told you, but because it uses FTU and SAB. SAB is appropriate for alternating components and FTU is consistent with what we're doing for other types of analysis. If we get a negative margin for this check, for this criteria, what does that mean? It means we, the part won't last forever. We need to reanalyze with more analysis. You got that? Make sure you spend enough time to understand this before you go on to the next lecture. Enjoy.